In two sessions, and the country is gearing up for reviving economic growth for this year and beyond. In today's program, we will discuss China's roadmap forward and its implications for the world with two distinguished economists. We're honored to have with us Professor Michael Spence, a Nobel Prize laureate in economics. Professor Spence's work has had a significant impact on the field of economics and beyond. He has also held numerous leadership positions, including Chairman of the Commission on Growth and Development. Welcome, Professor Spence. We're also delighted to be joined by Professor Justin Ling Yifu from Peking University, also Dean of the Institute of New Structural Economics. As a former chief economist of the World Bank, Professor Ling is known for his significant contribution to the field of development economics. In addition to his academic work, Professor Ling has actively participated in economic policy making in China. It's always a pleasure to have you with us, Professor Ling. So, Professor Spence, I'd like to start with your observation of Chinese economy, which is stabilizing from the uh, disruption of the COVID pandemic and is expected to pick up again this year. Furthermore, it's worth noting that China's leadership in pursuing modernization of the country is doubling down on its own development model, which appears to be a hybrid of capitalism and socialism. What's your thoughts and comments on this model? Do you believe Chinese economy is on the right track? Well, I think basically, yes. I mean, I've always believed that there's not one single model um, about the re relationship between the markets and government that works. I mean, the extremes don't work. You know, centrally, central planning didn't work. And various countries, you know, have tried some extreme form of small government, uh, you know, sometimes called market fundamentalism. And that didn't seem to work very well either. So in the kind of middle spectrum, I think, you know, China and the United States and other countries have placed themselves in different positions. But I don't have any reason to think that the Chinese model, which has been stupendously successful over four decades, um, is is going to fail to be successful in the future. And I think China is making I do expect a real a significant bounce back this year with the, you know, the elimination of the zero covid policy. And I, and I think, you know, China's making the kinds of investments partly on the private sector side and partly on the public sector side that we, we know drive growth. So, um, you know, I remain, look, it's a pretty tough world we live in right now. Yes. And we're going to all face headwinds to growth, you know, in the short run. But, but if we look out longer term, I, I remain optimistic about the potential of the Chinese economy. Hmm. And Professor Ling, for a significant period of time, China has learned from the Western model of <coughs> utilizing the market to allocate resources. And it has been underpinning China's economic su success for several decades. Could you help us understand why China is now exploring alternative paths? And some China observers say the uh, competition between economic models is a battle of political ideologies. Do you agree? Do you think China intends to challenge the West with a competing model? First, China always learn from the West, and China will continue to learn from the West. But China never copy any mm. models from other country. China always try to find in the facts, finding the truth from the facts. And so during the past 40 years and more, China started this transition to market economy. China did not follow the neoliberalism, China adopted a gradual dual track approach, continue to provide necessary support to the old sectors, which and you know, largely in the state owned sectors, but they went against China's competitive advantages. They are not viable in a competitive market, and but they are important for the for the stability, for the basic operation of the Chinese economy. So the government continue to support necessary transitory protection and subsidy to them. Mm -hmm. But the Chinese government liberalized the entry to the new sectors, which are labor intensive, which are consistent with China's competitive advantages. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese government not only liberalized you know, the entry to those new sectors by the private sectors, by the foreign direct investment, the Chinese government also actively facilitate their growth by helping them to do, to improve the infrastructure, to improve the business environment and so on. Mm. So by this kind of hybrid model, China achieve stability and dynamic economic growth, mm. unlike other transition economy, 
they try to just copy one version of this you know, economic models. And as a result, their economy collapse and are hit by crisis all the time. Mm. And I think China will continue to do similar things. Certainly with the economic development, income rise, people's expectation you know, also be raised. And the Chinese government need to adapt the policies in order to provide in a, uh, 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 in a, a better outcome to meet the people's expectations. Mm. And uh, I think that this is not China trying to, you know, try to challenge the Western model. China try to challenge the uh, uh, black ball models or textbook models. Mm. As Professor uh, uh, Spence mentioned, actually in any country, you know, they always need to have the market. They also need to have the state. Certainly, the role of the market and the state may be somewhat different according to the state of development, but you always right. need to have both market and a state to work organically. Mm -hmm. And I think China will continue to do that. Mm. Professor Spence, Absolutely. do you think market plus state is a good formula? Absolutely. Right. I mean, the, the state, you know, is responsible for stability, uh, which has many dimensions, including a kind of macroeconomic one. I completely agree with Justin. And, and the state also makes critical investments in human capital, you know, the science and technology base of the economy. These things just don't get invested at a high enough level um, if left to, entirely to the private sector because they have, you know, public, you know, public good characteristics, you know, mm. benefits that go way beyond the benefits that are appropriated to the private sector. So, and then, and then you have, you know, major challenges like, you know, I'm sure we'll come to them, you know, like climate change, where if you leave it up to the private sector, you, you just won't get the job done. So I'm, I'm completely on the same page with Justin. And I think one other comment, right? one of the hallmarks of China's success has been the ability, <clears throat> as Justin said, to be pragmatic, you know, to change the model when you need to, to change with the stage of development and so on. I mean, it's been it's about as successful as any country I can think of in doing exactly that. I call it navigating. Mm. Yep. Indeed, and Professor Spence, uh, it's important the state make right choices. China has mapped out several priorities in its future development, including high quality growth, common prosperity, innovation capability, climate change mitigation, and peaceful development. What's your views on these priorities? Will they help China transform itself into a high-income country amid challenges of slower growth and demographic <laughs> shift, and perhaps more importantly, the rising China-U.S. tensions and decoupling risks? Well, you know, the rising tensions and a bunch of other things that are going on in the global economy <clears throat> are unfortunate. I mean, we're living in a world in which we have wars, pandemics, climate shocks, increasing frequency and severity, and these tensions. And so it, the, what we're seeing is a kind of pattern of diversification. So everybody's sort of essentially hedging uh, for risk. And that's an mm. expensive process. And you're right, you know, we have aging in, I, my estimate is over 75% of the global economy in terms of GDP. I mean, we've got significant headwinds. Um, to overcome. And so I think in that context, the, the Chinese government's priorities are, are entirely right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do have to worry about what, you know, on the West we call income and wealth inequality, and then China is referred to as common prosperity. Mm -hmm. um, we do have to worry about growth. We were, you know, the Chinese <laughs> government faced with, you know, uh, restrictions on uh, various kinds of technology has to worry about you know, durability, resilience, self-sufficiency, and so on. So I have no quarrel with those priorities. I mean, the only thing I would add is, you know, it's slightly easier to write down priorities than it is to implement them. Uh, so mm. so, so the, the hard part comes when you sort of get about, especially if there's more than one, um, you know, of, uh, of making exactly the right choices as you, as you pursue these priorities. Again, I'm not pessimistic, but I, I think the hard part's getting the job done rather than writing down the priorities. 
Indeed, and as you talked about implementation, uh, we know that achieving, achieving common prosperity is an important goal for China. Uh, Professor Lin, do you think China can effectively address income inequality? How confident are you in achieving common prosperity while maintaining a vibrant market economy? I think it's a very important goal because we want to have growth, but we also want to let the growth benefit all the people. And what is the best way to have a dynamic economic growth and at the same time to allow all the people to enjoy the benefit of growth? Including you know, the lazy ones. Uh, lazy ones, no. They need to work. <laughs> as long as they want to work, <laughs> then they will have the opportunity <laughs> to make it big right. for themselves. Right. Mm. And, and the best way from the new structural economics, which I advocate, mm. is to you know, have uh, technological innovation and uh, industrial upgrading diversification according mm. to the competitive advantages of the Chinese economy. Because if we have the technological innovation and uh, industrial upgrading diversification, according to the competitive advantages determined by what we have, it will be most competitive, it will be dynamic, it will be sustainable. But at the same time, we can achieve not only efficiency, we can also achieve equity in mm -hmm. the primary income distribution. Because at this stage of China's development, certainly Compared to the advanced country, we are relative abundant in the labor supply and the skills in capitals. And so if we follow our competitive advantages, that means our industry will be relatively labor intensive. The technology we use will be relatively uh, uh, labor intensive. So by this way of development, we can generate the most number of jobs, mm. allow people to be employed. We know that low-income people, they rely on their labor force to make their livings. So if they can employ it, then this kind of growth will be pro, you know, in, you know, pro equity growth. Hmm. Not only so, we know that rich people, they make their incomes mostly from capitals. Yes. And uh, if we develop our economy very competitive, very dynamically, capital will be accumulated very quickly. Mm. So gradually, labor force will change from relatively abundant to relatively scarce. And then by that, the wage rate will increase a lot. So it benefits mm. the low income people. And uh, relatively speaking, the return to capital will decline. And uh, so the major source of earning or their you know, advantage of the rich people will be relatively decline. And uh, by this way, we can achieve you know, equity in the process of dynamic economic development. Mm. That is in a primary income distribution. And this can also enable the government to have a larger ability to improve the income by the secondary distribution. Because if the Chinese economy grows very dynamically, government revenue will increase quickly, more abundant resources for the government. And if we develop our economy according to our competitive advantages, firms will be viable. They do not rely on government subsidies and protection for their survival. And that means the government will have more resources to deal with the regional income disparity, urban rural disparity, and to invest more in education to enhance people's ability to be employed. And certainly, the government will also have the ability to take care of, you know, transition, uh, take care of people in, you know, when they were hit by shock and so on, when they, are, when they have encountered some, you know, uh, incidental uh, 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 shock and so on. So mm -hmm. we can also improve our secondary income distribution. And by this way, certainly, we can achieve, you know, common prosperity because we are going to have dynamic economic growth, but at the same time, the income distribution will be improved. Mm. And to develop the Chinese economy according to our competitive advantages, certainly on the one hand, we need to have a market. 
competition, and uh, you know, to have the relative prices to indicate which sector we have complete advantages. So market is very important. But in this dynamic economic growth process, state is also very important to overcome all kinds of market failures. So I think that, you know, by this common prosperity, we'll continue to follow the market principle with a facilitation state. Hmm. Um, Professor Spence, what's your view on Professor Ling's model? Is it uh, uh, feasible? Uh, uh, what's your, uh, because uh, is it a difficult balancing act if it goes too far on common prosperity in economic theory? Does it inevitably lead to lower efficiency? No, you know, that used to be the kind of narrative in economics, I think Justin would agree. And I, you know, and I think it was because, you know, the instruments for dealing with inequality were viewed mainly as redistribution instruments. Mm -hmm. um, what Justin's talking about, and I agree completely, is the better approach to this is on the supply side. Uh, you know, on the way the economy evolves structurally, um, you know, following comparative advantage and so on. China has some advantages in this respect. The government still owns a very substantial batch of assets that gives it resources, not, mm -hmm. met much more than it, you find in most other countries. It gives the government resources that they can deploy, you know, uh, in pursuit of important objectives like this. The only thing I would say is that um, I think China, you know, is a very advanced country now, especially technologically. So I, I don't think what I'm about to say is off topic at all. But the but the big powerful drivers of productivity right now are coming essentially from the from technology, from the mm -hmm. digital side. Now, parts of it are actually good. I mean, the consumer side, you know, the platform economy properly regulated and so on. And the and the ubiquity of the the mobile internet, you know, means that those those uh, the growth patterns associated with that are highly inclusive. But basically, these powerful tools are operating in what used to be called the knowledge economy. And there's fairly large parts of an economy um, <coughs> that are so far relatively unaffected. Um, and at least in many economies, these are um, very very big employment sectors. You know, so in the United States, for example, uh, you know, government, health care, hospitality, you know, hotels, foods and restaurants, uh, education, construction. You know, when you look at the productivity numbers, they're A, low and B, not growing. Uh, and the reason is these are basically sectors that thus far have not been touched very much by technology. So I think they're so, you know, one of the things I was looking at as a result of the two sessions was this focus on directing some of the technology development in a, in a, in a direction that would actually change that pattern, right? Make their, produce a better balance between the knowledge economy, you know, where the finance people and other folks have, Justin and I live in the knowledge economy, you do in the media, um, that's different than the people who are, you know, working in restaurants or building, uh, building buildings and so on. So I, I think that's, a, you know, I viewed that as a pretty sophisticated insight um, into at least one dimension of achieving the common prosperity objective. Mm. Well, I think both China and U.S. have uh, emphasized on the importance of technology. Uh, Professor Lin, do you think uh, the, the, the U.S. is trying more and more uh, to contain China's technology advancement uh, with its uh, measures on uh, strategic sectors like the chip sector? Uh, what is the prospects of China's technology innovation in driving China's economy in the future? Well. Certainly, technological innovation is very important for further improvement in the productivity in China. And, uh, but uh, we see the U.S. has the intention to put some kind of you know, trouble for Chinese importation of technology. But we know that most technology can come from different sources because the U.S. does not have monopoly on every technology. For certain technology, 
the U.S. may try to embargo. And but most other technology, China still will be able to have technological exchanges with other countries. And for the fewer technology, which the U.S. has a monopoly, mm. if they try to have an embargo, then the U.S. company will have to pay a high cost for that. Because for those kind of technology, the U.S. companies will have to invest a lot to invent those kind of technology. And once they are successful in the invention, how profitable depends on how large the markets. And we know that China now has the largest market for many kind of technological product. So if those companies, right. they do not share their technology, hmm. their product to China, they may turn from high profitability to low profitability, or even incurring losses mm. because high cost for their invention. Mm. And if you have low technology uh, profit or incurring losses, they mm. will not be able to continue to invest to maintain their technological leadership. So in that regard, the US, if they try to embargo the technology to China, certainly it hurt China, but it also hurt the US economy. Mm. And uh, and uh, certainly we hope we have a technological you know, cooperation because in our trade is always a win-win for both sides. It's good for China, it's also good for the US. But if the US due to political consideration try to embargo those kind of technology, since those are only in a few areas, and I think China reaches that stage. Once it's necessary, China will be able to mobilize enough human capital financial resources to make a breakthrough in those areas. It's a pity and that we have no choice, but I think the Chinese policy is very clear. We want to embrace globalization. We want to embrace trade. We want to embrace, you know, a uh, 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 new based uh, global system. And if you follow that, I think we should continue to have the cooperation. Mm. Uh, Professor Spence, given uh, the importance of the <coughs> technology sector, do you think uh, it is a good idea for the U.S. to decouple its technology sector with China? No, uh, I don't. Uh, but, you know, we've got some work to do. Um, first of all, I, mean, I agree with what Justin just said. I mean, I, I think first of, the first order of business is you know to deal with the overlap of sort of national security issues you know these are dual use technologies right at least some of them are uh, and that overlap is unfortunate because you know when the national security agenda dominates then it tends to produce more restrictions and fragmentation on the economic side in the global you know system that you know trades goods but also, you know, moves technology around and investment as well. Um, so I, I think the first order of business is to contain that and to make it as small as possible and as less, it, it, you know, and so that it has as, as the minimal impact or the minimal possible impact on the, not only on the two countries, but on the rest of the world. I mean, the rest of the world's not happy, you know, with a, with a, a, a movement in the direction of, you know, sort of, uh, a kind of dual economic structure in the global economy. Um, the other thing we have to rebuild is trust. I mean, you know, all of these mm. things in the end depend on trust. And I think, you know, we're going to have to rely uh, in spite of political headwinds. And, and Justin's right, they're significant, uh, at least on the American side. Um, you know, leadership, you know, to find ways to cooperate uh, and to maintain a reasonably open system. Look, I mean, you know, in the area of climate change, mm. uh, if we sort of divide up into two parts and don't share technology and insights and so on, we've essentially got no chance of achieving the goal of, uh, you know, zero emissions or zero net emissions or any version of that you want to call it. I mean, a stable climate situation. So there's lots of reasons to work hard on this, but unfortunately, the the winds are blowing in the, in not in the right direction at the moment, and I, and I hope that changes. Mm. Right, and Professor, I hope Leon, our conversation can contribute to mm. uh, in a better trust, better understanding, and uh, improve the 
in other nations in the right direction. Mm. Well, uh, Professor Ling, let's go back to uh, the topic of Chinese economy. You know, the government plays a crucial role in China's um, economic development model, but how can the government uh, ensure that it functions effectively? Is there an institutional guarantee for a good government? Well, I think that all the governments want to do good things because mm -hmm. for the people and uh, for their own reputations and also for their own stabilities. So I think the government always has good intentions. Uh, but uh, if we want to make a good intention to have a good result, we need to have a good understanding what works, what do not work. And for that, we need to have a right theory about how the economic, you know, operate, how the economic develop. And uh, we also need to understand country uh, at different stage of development, the opportunity and the challenges are different. And uh, you have a right and a good understanding. I think it, you know, the government will have the intention to do the right things and uh, the success will enhance their abilities, their competence, their capability. And uh, in this way, I think the institution and other things will also improve. Mm. And that's the reason why I'm trying to you know, advocate the new theory based on the success and the failures, failures in China and other developing countries to come up with a better understanding about what works, what do not work. And actually, Professor Spence, he chaired the Growth Commission you know, to mm -hmm. study the successful experiences of certain economies uh, after the Second World War they reached 7% or more growth rate continuously, continuously for 25 or more years. And those kind of studies are very helpful mm -hmm. for the government to improve their performance. Mm -hmm. Professor Spence, um, I noticed that in the US and EU, there are also more use of state-directed economic policies like state spending on strategic industries, more protectionism and less free trade. And some say the Washington consensus faces <coughs> increasing challenges. Would you agree? <laughs> what? What, I mean, Justin and I both know the Washington consensus in certain forms faced challenges almost the instant that came into existence. Yeah, actually, I wrote something on this recently. The, 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 the Washington Consensus that John Williamson wrote is actually a pretty sensible document. Uh, the problem was that it was interpreted as kind of a mandate for, you know, market fundamentalism and went mm -hmm. off in the wrong direction. So, you know, uh, but I, but the, the substance of your question, there's no no question in the West we're making mid-course corrections. Uh, you know, away from privatization, away from re excessive reliance on markets, toward more industrial policy. And, you know, and for the most part, this is good, right? I mean, for example, the, the United States dropped out of the climate, you know, challenge under the Trump administration. Well, we're back in it. You know, mm -hmm. you can argue that we, you know, we're not quite on the right track. We've, we're, we're doing it with subsidies because we have an allergy to taxes in America. So we not, mm. you know, haven't put a, you know, particularly stiff price on carbon and maybe we won't be able to, but at least we're in the game. Um, and, you know, investing heavily in the science and technology uh, is a good thing for any country that can afford it. And China certainly can and is doing that. The, the, the only problematic parts, of, you know, and they all get built into the same pieces of legislation are the are the parts that are you know sort of directly adverse to other countries you know the protectionist part um and so they unfortunately they're coming along at the same time so if you look at the the um the 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 main act that you know supports the development of semiconductors it really has three parts advance the technology uh build domestic capability that's what both china and the united states and maybe others are going to do because of uh concerns about access um but then there's a part of it that is directly focused on uh restricting access to certain uh, pieces of equipment and technology to china and that's the more problematic part that we were talking and they're all come you know they all come in the same package right mm -hmm. so so Bottom line is, you know, I, 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 I think 
if I could just summarize, the way the global the global economy is functioning right now is not going to help us solve the major challenges that humanity faces. Right? You know, bring up the lower income countries, give them a chance, uh, deal with the climate agenda, and so on. Um, and so, you know, we're going to have to rely on citizens, trust, cooperation, and leadership um, to change this direction if we can. Mm. And Professor Lane, what's your views on this? The course in the world is not you know, fully in line with the challenge we are facing. We need, to, we need to have more cooperation instead of the attempt to you know, decouple or, the, or to deglobalization. But you know, if we want to have a right course, to build a trust among the leadership is essential. And uh, to make that possible, I think exchanges and you know, among people dialogue like this and our cooperation exchanges among academic people, among the media, the press, and allow people you know, in this country to have a better understanding about the benefit of globalization and uh, the global challenge we face and to cope with these kind of challenges, the only way out is cooperation. If we have a, this kind of understanding, and I think it, it can help the change course to the right direction. Mm. Um, Professor Spence, I'd like to uh, have you share with us your views on world economic outlook. In particular, the recent banking turmoil has triggered fears of a broader financial <laughs> crisis. Well, the banks in trouble have their own missteps, but are there underlying issues in the financial system and how will this affect the trajectory of world economy? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, so uh, first of all, we lived for many, many, you know, more than a decade, probably more like three, in a world in, with very few supply constraints. Um, we had no signs of inflation in the last decade. Basically, we had inflation, but I'm talking about the West now, right? Mm -hmm. Inflation below targets. We have a generation of people who lived in that world and never lived in a, you know, in, in, in a supply constrained, you know, inflationary environment. And then all of a sudden, right, partly because of the pandemic and partly because of more secular trends, um, of the type that we talked about before, you know, aging, right, exhausting mm -hmm. the supply of huge incremental uh, productive capacity coming from the emerging economies, not exhausting. The central banks are raising interest rates, and they're raising interest rates in an environment mm -hmm. which was configured because of the long period of low interest rates for low interest rates. And so we're going to have accidents as the, the mm -hmm. bottom line. We're going to have, we haven't seen the end of this. We're going to have, you know, entities like banks, but not just banks. You know, the non-bank credit um, system is going to, you know, uh, get upset, and we'll have more of these. Hopefully, the policy responses will be alert enough to prevent some systemic problem. And I don't think there's evidence yet that we have a kind of systemic uh, problem of, of financial imbalance in the global system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so this is going to happen within our economies and the rising interest rates and the effect on exchange rates um, is not making life very easy for a wide range of emerging economies either. So this is a, a, diff a really difficult period of transition. You know, when in the West we talked about, you know, do we kill off growth? Do we fight inflation? How fast do we fight inflation? Now, you know, they have another trade-off to make, uh, which is, you know, the trade-off between the speed of uh, interest rate hikes and, and quant you know, essentially shrinking the balance sheets, the reverse of quantitative easing mm -hmm. um, that's going on on the one hand and potential impacts on, on the stability of various financial institutions. So, I mean, we don't know the outcome right now, but right now it looks like, you know, if you want to set this in context, uh, we're going. We we we're going into a very unusual period after a long period of living in a different world, um, and the the system is you know whether it's the regulatory system or the financial institutions they're not set up 
for this and, and we are going to have accidents. Do you think the Fed handled this well? Um, and what about the, uh, the, the future uh, capability considering the U.S. debt standing at uh, 31.4 trillion U.S. dollars? You know, on that last point, I mean, if you look at the data, um, sovereign debt in, as a result of the pandemic rose to over 100 percent globally, right? Mm. So, <laughs> I mean, everybody's kind of in the same boat. No, having sovereign debt at those levels uh, in a rising interest rate environment with the effect it has on fiscal space is not ideal, to put it mildly. Um, now, in that one, I'm less inclined to be critical because we didn't have a choice, right? The mm. pandemic, you could either let it run or try to protect businesses and households, which is what most governments with fiscal capacity did. And, th and this was the result. So, you know, so that that's pretty tough. On, mm. on the question of what whether the Fed has been right or wrong, I mean, I you know, there's many dimensions to that. Were they were they late to the game? Almost everybody agrees they were. You know, they they said these these inflationary pressures were transitory. And, you know, just a lot of them weren't. Um, that means they're hiking faster than they might have had before. Maybe that, you know, is one of the consequences of, of being, you know, uh, of misestimating the, the dimensions of the in inflationary problem. Uh, in this environment so far, I think the policymakers have handled this pretty well. I mean, there's all kinds of criticism about moral hazard and this and that, you know, but you don't want the system to start to kind of uh, fail, especially the small and, and medium sized banks. The last dimension is, is that has emerged is whether the regulatory regime has been adequate or not. Uh, and there are real questions about that. The Fed itself and maybe even Congress will launch investigations about, you know, whether anybody was really paying attention to the Silicon Valley Bank's balance sheet enough to anticipate uh, the kind of problems that that they got into. So it, it's a multidimensional thing. I, I don't think... Um, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be recorded as having said that, you know, the Fed or any other central bank is just making mistake after mistake. Um, we and they are navigating in a fairly um, new and uncertain environment. Indeed, a very uh, tough environment. And uh, Professor Ling, what's your assessment of the global financial system and economic outlook? And what do you think about China's uh, financial sector's resilience? Well, I agree with Professor Spence. There's a lot of challenges and uncertainty in the global economy due to all those issues as discussed. But for the Chinese economy, I'm confident China will continue to maintain the stability and growth. Except you have some black swan to have some kind of financial crisis like in 2008. But other than that, I think Chinese growth this year is likely to, you know, uh, 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 more than what was targeted, 0.5 percent and around. China is most likely to grow, you know, be beyond 5 percent this year. And the Chinese financial sectors, the Chinese government already pay a lot of attention to the, you know, health of the financial sectors in the past decades. So I think the China financial sector will be resilient. So mm -hmm. overall. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world, mm. but we can have confidence. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Many thanks again to our guests, Professor Ling and Professor Spence. Your views and comments are appreciated. So hopefully our discussion have offered more clarity on China's roadmap going forward and a role it plays in the evolving global economy. And that's all for our special edition of BizTalk on CGTN. I'm Guan Xing in Beijing. See you next time.